Age of Nature is a three-part special series airing on PBS. It premiered uh, last Wednesday, October 14th. Episode two is tomorrow at 10, uh, 10 p.m. Eastern time. Age of Nature is about the human relationship with nature. The three questions uh, that Age of Nature asks is, what have our past mistakes taught us about nature? How is our understanding of nature changing the way we live? And as the challenges we face mount, where are we headed next? And so uh, PBS was giving grants out to local stations uh, in the PBS system, member stations, to, uh, to ask these questions uh, locally in their own local areas. And I thought the Apalachicola River and Bay watershed was probably an ideal place to, to ask these questions. Obviously there are a lot of current uh, and former problems uh, in the Apalachicola watershed. And so um, we're gonna play a, a few minutes from the second episode of Age of Nature coming up here. But first I'm gonna introduce our panelists. We're, we're, we're gonna have a nice discussion here. I, I like really excited about this panel that we have today. So we have um, Temperance Morgan is the executive director of the Nature Conservancy in Florida. Hi Temperance. Hi, nice to be here. Uh, Brian Pelk is the rest restoration project manager for the Nature Conservancy in Florida. Brian, let's go. Uh, Georgia Ackerman is the Apalachicola Riverkeeper and Executive Director of Apalachicola Riverkeeper Organization. Doug yeah, Alderson is it's going. Uh, Doug Alderson is the Outreach and Advocacy Director for the Apalachicola Riverkeeper. I don't see Lily on tonight, uh, but so um, hopefully she'll pop in. But we also have Susan Cerulean, who's a, a nature author, and tonight she's going to be reading a couple of selections from her newest book, "I Have Been Assigned the Single Bird: A Daughter's Memoir." And so uh, before we get to the conversation, we're gonna roll, uh, play a little video from tomorrow's episode of Age of Nature. It's in a watershed across the country, which uh, in Washington state, which, uh, which I think, well, it's a much different place than where we are here in Florida. It has a certain connectivity that I, that I liked that I thought was relevant to Apalachicola. Straight watch, Mojo. Mojo, straight watch, go ahead. Hi, I uh, just wanted to let you know we're coming on scene here and we're just going to do some uh, distant fluke follows. For 15 years, Dr. Deborah Giles has been studying this community of orcas. Gosh, the southern resident killer whale population is critically endangered. We only have 73 individuals at this point. Records show this is the lowest they've been for 40 years. I've dedicated my professional life to trying to study them, to try and um, help answer questions that will lead to hopefully their recovery. Giles works with an unusual research assistant. Let's get her out. OK, baby. Eba, the orca dog. Good girl, let's get it. Eva, it's okay. She plays a vital role. Sniffing out orca feces. Oh my goodness, are you gonna get a poop? Are you gonna do it? Good girl, let's get it. This is it, yeah. this is it. She took me to it. Good job. Good job. Good job. Nice. Get that one. This is like gold. It really is like gold. There, we can learn so much about this population of animals. The fecal samples reveal something surprising. These orcas are feeding almost exclusively on one species of fish, Chinook salmon. The sad thing is that through the millennia, 700,000 or more years, Chinook salmon was humongous and abundant. And it was plenty to keep a, a large population of killer whales thriving. But within 150 years, we have completely decimated almost all wild Chinook salmon runs that these whales would have relied on. 
The whales are severely malnourished. The samples of their feces can help explain why. The thing that samples like this can tell us is what actually, what is this? What was this meal? So was it salmon? If it was salmon, what species of salmon? And also, um, in some cases, um, if it's not too degraded, what river uh, it came from? Uh, and not only what river, but even what tributary it came from. It's like a gold mine. Chinook salmon spend most of their lives at sea, but return to the rivers of their birth to spawn. Rivers like this one, the Elwha in Washington State. It flows through the old growth forest of Olympic National Park. These streams and tributaries always provided a safe sanctuary for the Chinook salmon to breed. But 100 years ago, everything changed. Two hydroelectric dams were installed on the Elwha River to power industrial growth. Migrating salmon now faced an impassable barrier. Unable to get further up the river, the survival and reproduction of the salmon was severely compromised. Robert Elofsen is from the Lower Elwha Kalam tribe, who have lived here for generations. I worked in the, in the Park Service 40 years ago, and when you were above the dams, you never saw any salmon. I would sit there and think what a beautiful river it is, and except there's no salmon in it. It wasn't always like this. Before the dams were built, there are stories about enough, there being enough salmon in the river that you could rock across their backs. They were so thick. The size of them was also remarkable. A fish could weigh up to 100 pounds. The lower Elwha Kalam tribe had relied on salmon for centuries, so they campaigned to get them back. The fight to get the dams removed took about 35 years. It began in the 1980s. That's when the environmental groups and the tribe started to work for phase-out removal and acquisition of the dams. It was time for the dams to go. In 2014, the river was free again. But no one knew if and when the wild fish would return. I love being out here with these fish. John McMillan is a fish scientist, studying the recovery of the river. The past 10 years working on the L, I'd say have been probably the most special in my whole life. I think when I added up, and I've snorkeled about 1,800 miles, so a lot of time in the water. And now that we've opened up over 70 miles of new habitat, we're starting to see the Chinook salmon really take off. I believe that my counts of juvenile Chinook salmon have tripled from what they were three years ago. John has now recorded a spawning run of nearly 8,000 fish and seen them in headwaters 60 miles upstream. Oh, 
Wow. There are a lot of fish in there, uh, both juveniles and adult Chinook, and so far it's looking like it's going to be an awesome year, so I'm excited about that. This rise in salmon numbers has a far-reaching impact on the whole forest. The salmon bring vital marine-derived nutrients upriver. providing a wealth of food for others living here. And their decomposing bodies put vital nitrogen and phosphorus into the soil, enabling the trees to grow three times faster than without them. Large-bodied, abundant fish provide nutrients and food sources literally for the whole ecosystem. Everything from animals that are here in freshwater, from the insects uh, to the birds, to the orcas and seals that live out there in the ocean. These salmon are literally a keystone species that connects the marine world to the freshwater world. The governor of the state of Washington, Jay Inslee, has environmental issues high on his agenda. Well, the Elwha Dam uh, project, when it first came up as an idea, it's like many ideas, it was revolutionary. It has been such a thrill to see Mother Nature recovery now that they've been removed. I can't think of a more inspirational place or story than to see Mother Nature coming back uh, like a freight train. Things are improving, but we don't yet know if it's enough to help the orcas. Orcas are in a very fragile position right now, but we're not done yet, and it's like many things. Uh, we just need to go faster. Governor Inslee has issued an executive order putting together a committee of scientists and dedicating a budget of a billion dollars to try and save this endangered population. one shot to prevent extinction. And so uh, we gotta make sure that we go faster than we are even today. Understanding how ecosystems are connected is a big part of restoring nature. Life is a complex web where every creature has its place. As we learn more about what that is, we're in a better position to look after them. All right, so again, that is Age of Nature, episode two, understanding, that's the, the first scene. And I love the, uh, I guess, the interconnectivity of the different ecosystems around the river from the forest to the orcas and there they're all connected by salmon obviously it's different here in Florida but I thought that was a good good first uh, uh, good scene for us to preview as we talk about the Apalachicola watershed. So uh, next I want to talk to Susan Cerulean. Susan is one of our area's top nature authors and recently she's released a book with themes that I thought really fit with uh, our themes today that we're talking about with age of nature. So before we start our discussion Sue, uh, let's hear a passage from uh, I've Been Assigned a Single Bird, a Daughter's Memoir. Thanks, Rob. Our human species has placed the integrity of life on our tender emerald planet so greatly at risk. We live at the end of the Cenozoic, the great flowering age of plant and animal diversity, 12,000 years of tranquil and stable climate. We are witnessing now, though, how our enterprise is scalding Earth's oceans and atmosphere and leading us into a period of mass extinction. 
We've lost nearly 3 billion individual wild birds since 1970. The loss of each species, the muting of any one voice limits our planet's once infinite possibilities. I have wondered, what are the fractured places in our hearts and minds and spirits that have allowed us to stand by and watch and even to participate in the destruction of so much life? It's a kind of dementia, don't you think? Consider this, the earth is the brain and the body into which we were born. In some nearly parallel way, we face not only a crisis in the extraordinary number of individual people suffering from Alzheimer's and other kinds of dementia, but as a culture, we are stricken with this disease. For why else would we knowingly destroy the planet that sustains our very lives? Our Western economic and political systems, all the ways we personally consume and give over our power to corporations and oligarchs, these are the dementing illnesses that are killing our planet. When you have the physical disease, you experience it alone. But this is cultural dementia. It's similar to a dementing illness in a single human brain, because in both cases, the afflicted suffer from the paradigm of perpetual growth, the smothering and over exploitation of diversely beautiful, but unprotected land, waters and wild creatures. In the body of a single afflicted human being, we watch as the beautiful life forces of our beloved are dissolved. We know they did nothing to invite this disease into their brain. But for the earth as a whole, the dementing disease our system of economic and political dominance is animated by cumulative human actions, guided by legal and economic systems that treat the natural world as property, not as an ecological partner. Our cultural dementia has induced a climate crisis of epic proportions and the largest extinction event in 65 million years, but we can choose another path. Thank you, Susan. That's great. That's wonderful. Um, so let's move now to back to the Apalachicola watershed. And we're talking about sort of the, the man-made problems on the river, uh, Georgia and Doug. Let's talk about, it's interesting because the Apalachicola River actually has a lot of protected land along it. Um, a lot of its issues come with uh, authorizations to the river itself and, and its freshwater flows. Thanks, Rob. Um, Doug's going to screen share and share a few slides. I greatly enjoyed the present the uh, clip of the video that we just saw because like the parallels to what was happening in Washington or um, there are parallels to what's happening to the Apalachicola River. Um, as you know, Riverkeeper is dedicated to the protection, the restoration, and the stewardship of Apalachicola Bay. We're a Keeper Alliance member. Um, the challenges that we've seen to the river um, in the past several decades are related to the changes that have been made by um, putting reservoirs and um, upstream dams along the Chattahoochee River, which feeds the Apalachicola River. And as you know, the Apalachicola River and Flint River meet to create Woodruff Dam. Um, throughout that time, prior to um, dredging ending in the early 2000s, we had um, extreme man-induced changes to the river, if you will. So when um, river flows are altered, when channel is changed by, by dredging and deepening of a channel, we see negative impacts such as um, the drying of the floodplain, the loss of trees. So all the way down to the Apalachicola Bay, the impacts are probably best known, um, uh, the oyster decline in the Apalachicola Bay over the years. The fresh water of the Apalachicola River is the driver of productivity for the Apalachicola Bay. That fresh water also impacts um, the Eastern Gulf of Mexico. The tree loss that we've seen in the floodplain as a result of, of uh, reduction in the freshwater flow coming downstream has created these tremendous problems for us. Um, as we've noted here on the slide that these require both policy changes as well as 
um, boots on the ground, so to speak, in terms of um, changes to the um, uh, fixing some of the problems that have caused. And the slide that, that Doug just jumped to momentarily was uh, uh, about our slough restoration project, um, which is an attempt to uh, recover and fix the slough systems. We've got 400 miles of uh, creeks, rivers, or excuse me, creek streams um, and lakes in the Apalachicola system that are uh, part of the Apalachicola River. And many of these sloughs have been disconnected from the main channel as a result of years of dredging. I'm going to pause there um, and let Doug um, talk a little bit more on this. So we have three, um, three main sloughs that we're addressing in this period for the next uh, three to four years. Uh, Douglas Slough, um, Spider's Cut, and the East River. So two of those will greatly uh, uh, enhance the water going into the floodplain below Weewahitchka that will help the Tupelo honey industry that, that WFSU recently highlighted. And the other one, uh, the East River will benefit the East Bay, which is a highly productive section of the bay and all of these sloughs have been basically almost cut off at low water. They are cut off at low water because of past dredging from the Corps of Engineers. So it's a, it's a process of removing sand, uh, taking the sand away from the river and the floodplain. Gotcha. So it's an exciting project, gives a lot of hope. It will, will enhance uh, both fresh water and nutrients going into the Apalachicola Bay. And so, so we also have pollution threats. And so we have some good news in that a few years ago that we joined with partners in and uh, a Clean Water Act violation challenge with Gulf Power because their coal ash ponds that have been going on for decades was were leaching into the Apalachicola River with heavy metals. And so we did some water testing right at the outflow. So we proved that and we settled out of court with them and they agreed to uh, remove the ash and they are in the process of doing that. As far as we know, we get monthly reports and they are following that agreement and the ash is being removed from the river floodplain. The ongoing issue is the Chola Petroleum uh, leases. Calhoun County um, approved the leases, DEP approved the leases and they, they are currently active. This is a Texas company that wants to drill in the Apalachicola River 100 year floodplain in Calhoun County. So we are opposing that and trying to raise as much awareness about that as we can. So on a, on a positive note, Rob has done some great work along with his, his colleagues in the Apalachicola Basin for many years from River Trek to uh, going out with different scientists in the river and the bay and the floodplain. So I encourage you to look at the different blogs and videos he has over the years. And so we have links to these on our website. And this is our website. So you can find our many blogs and different initiatives that we're doing projects and, um, and we'll talk in a, in a few minutes about some of the impacts Hurricane Michael uh, had on the, the river and the bay as well. For sure, for sure. Well, thank you, Doug. I think uh, uh, from, I guess we will, you guys cover the floodplain and sort of, uh, sort of all the nutrients that it provides for the bay and just that connectivity there. Now I wanna move up to the uplands. So the, as you see, there's a river bluff here in Doug's slide. Um, and uh, north of that, that looks like a Stephanogla area. This maybe? is a Stephanogla. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So north of that, about 20 miles, is Allen Bluff, which is the tallest geological outcropping in uh, North Florida. And uh, right around that area is the Apalachicola Bluffs and Ravines Preserve, where uh, in the uplands, um, the Nature Conservancy in Florida is restoring upland uh, sand hill, longleaf, pine, fire adapted habitat. So, uh, Brian and Temperance, uh, talk to us about what's been done there uh, to, to restore that habitat. Great, Thank, thanks Rob. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk a bit about our preserve at App Apalachicola Bluffs and some of the other work we're doing in the watershed. And so, you know, one of the things in the earlier footage regarding salmon um, that it highlighted is the interconnectedness of ecosystems and how human impacts in one area can have cascading effects in so many ways. And our Apalachicola, um, we call it ABRP for short, it's a little easier. Um, is the perfect example of an interconnected ecosystem that was really degraded when it came to us and has gone undergone a complete transformation since. And in a moment, I want to let Brian really speak to some of the details of that because it was him and his colleagues, um, their blood, sweat, and tears 
that have allowed us to do some tremendous um, upland restoration on the ABRP site. Um, before we acquired it, it was managed as a pine plantation. Um, so that meant things like the vegetation types and animal species uh, composition on the site, the fire patterns, the water cycles, the topography, all had been altered as a result of the, the plantation, plantation operations. And we wanted to restore the site. So our team set about to, uh, to think about how we could do innovative longleaf and ground restoration um, recovery. A lot of work had been done in longleaf, not nearly as much in um, ground cover restoration, which we knew was important. Um, so our team developed some really um, innovative techniques that we've been able to expand beyond the preserves boundaries to our partners and neighbors in the region and even across the southeastern US. And so thanks to that effort that I'll let, again, let Brian speak to, um, ABRP is now able to serve its intended role as an upland, as a very unique upland in this larger Apalachicola watershed. So it serves as a tremendous biodiversity hub. Um, this whole watershed does, but this site in particular has um, a remark remarkable juxtaposition of these longleaf pine sandhill uplands and these steep head ravines, uh, which Brian may talk about. And that has created such a unique situation from a biodiversity standpoint and uh, has allows this site to provide benefits all the way down to the bay um, in the way of sand deposition from the site, uh, water, water filtration and supply, um, and a number of other benefits obviously it provides to the, the downstream watershed. Um, so I'm gonna pass it to Brian. Um, we do have some other efforts going on in, in the watershed on uplands and, and in the water um, outside of our preserve, um, but we'll save that for later in the conversation and I'll, I'll throw it to Brian for any follow-up details. Great, thank you, Temperance. I appreciate it, and I appreciate uh, Rob all your hard work uh, tromping around our neighborhoods and and bringing uh, a bright light to the to the work that many of us are doing in the places that uh, that we value so much. So yes, thank you, Temperance, for for laying out the ABRP story. Um, we have been working in this Sand Hill property for uh, close to thirty years now, and have um, learned a tremendous amount that we've been able to share with many of our partners, both regionally and, and um, extending out into the Southeast. And I, I, I would be completely remiss if I didn't immediately start talking about fire because that's such an important piece and important driver of the ecosystem um, in Sand Hill, in Flatwoods, in, in all the longleaf uh, ecosystems throughout the Southeast. And one of the reasons why ground cover restoration was um, pretty, pretty quickly uh, understood to be um, and an important piece in the whole ecosystem restoration was its ability to, to uh, produce the kind of fires um, that longleaf and thus the whole rest of the ecosystem from gopher tortoises to Bachman sparrows to you know rare asters and, and other wildflowers, um, they all rely on this um, you know very um, intricate and delicately balanced um, uh, dance between disturbance and recovery and and the species you know we see it when we when we burn a sandhill site we see it in how quickly the wiregrass uh, comes back and then how quickly when we restore an old sand pine plantation back to longleaf how quickly bachman sparrows move in and start doing their nesting work it's it's an astounding um bit of feedback that we get from mother nature when when i when i suspect we're doing things correctly um, and we um, and we can start providing that space and and the way that this relates back to the river many of you probably understand this well but it's it's worth explaining is you know the the assemblage of plants that are in the uplands directly affects the water that's going down into the river and the way that that works is that the soil the roots the microbes and fungi that are in the soil they all participate in the filtration of that water so as precipitation comes down um, on the landscape and of course the floodplain gathers this water over you know hundreds of thousands of of, of acres um, and 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 funnels it all down to the river that water which has come through a, a well-managed forest is cleaner and it is more abundant because the fire that we uh, that we implement in those uplands helps uh, filter the species community, the, the assemblage of, of plants and thus the assemblage of animals that all relate back to how much water is available. And, and a, a great contrast to that is if we just pull fire away from the landscape, what happens in many cases is that you know, water loving oaks and, and hardwoods and, and um, broadleaf trees will fill in 
um, where the grasses and the pines were and and the water will generally go up into the atmosphere because they use a lot more of that water in their e evapotranspiration whereas the the uh, very droughty tolerant and and high and dry adapted species that are typical of these sites uh, are much more uh, uh, less much less water using and so th the excess water that's available is able to to percolate down through these coarse soils, get cleaned up, and then um, ultimately end up down in um, in the Apalachicola River and, and feeding the oysters and, and the entire economy that's all along the way. So, so this connection between the uplands and, and the, the coast uh, is, is really, it's beautiful, it's powerful, it's also a huge responsibility. And I just want to say that, you know, managing these forests uh, with prescribed fire, with battling invasives, it is an, an ongoing battle. It's something that we're, you know, committed to as a surrogate for mother nature uh, in perpetuity. And, and that requires resources. So I urge you to go to nature.org and make a donation or hike our Garden of Eden trail and, and visit our little Iron Ranger and, and um, leave us a little bit that, that, that'll help out. Thank you, Brian. Uh, yeah, I love the Garden of Eden Trail. Took that took my kids there a few months ago, and that was a video we produced. And, and so uh, everything Brian talked about was in part one of our first our first Age of Nature video. Uh, it's a two parts. Uh, we did two parts on Apalachicola bluffs and ravines and sort of how fire affects um, the flow of water down to the watershed. And in our second video, we're going to take a look at uh, sort of the biodiversity of the area and an area that's being restored. Um, it's amazing to me. We went to a place that uh, where there are not a, you know, tall longleaf pine yet, and we were able to find a lot of rare endemic plant species, and um, and then down into the ravine, and we look at sort of um, sort of uh, effects from Hurricane Michael down there and then throughout the watershed, and that's where we're going to push the conversation next. So uh, now, Paul, let's roll that second video. We hear it a lot about this region. The Apalachicola Bluffs and Ravines, very unique system, one of the five biological hotspots in North America. It's one of only five places in all of North America that have the highest biodiversity that we see in the continent. That means this is a wild place, untouched by human hands, right? You know, I thought growing up that it's a wild space, you leave it alone, don't interfere, and it does its thing. But just by secluding fire, we have greatly interfered. Driven by regular fire, longleaf pine was the dominant habitat of the American Southeast. But only 5% of this iconic landscape remains. The Nature Conservancy and Torreya State Park are restoring thousands of acres of longleaf in this region, which is helping to preserve its famed biodiversity. So this was all completely, you know, moonscaped, all the pine plantation trees, sand pine was, was the specific tree that was uh, out here. The site was cleared. They restore wiregrass first. This is the foundation of the understory. A big emphasis on wiregrass, so of course that's what we have a lot of, but come back in 50 years and the idea is this place, we will have created sort of the, the, the bones, the structure, and then mother nature will add all those details over time and our, our list will get bigger and bigger. Some of the plants that have started showing up here are rare, but whether they're rare and local or widespread and common, they all have their value. This is the Apalachicola rosemary, Conradina glabra. And then right next to it, it's a great example, is Planopodium dentatum, Florida calamint. They're both mint family relatives and they're both very rare. This one is endemic, this one is almost endemic but it occurs in Georgia as well. Yeah, aren't they cool? So the common name for these is sand squares. Lots of little bees and other insects appreciate them. Delea pinnata, the common name is summer farewell. And I always love to see it blooming because it is a signifier of cooler weather to come. Where the uplands start to dip into the ravine, Lily finds another rare wildflower. Yeah, this is Liatris golsonii. The Golson's blazing star, a very rare, endangered, endemic plant species that pretty much only occurs on these slopes 
It's an adventuresome life. <laughs> I don't really know where to start. In the ravine, we find that Hurricane Michael has altered the plant community. A lot of what's down and, and all over the ground is because of the hurricane, and that isn't the normal condition of these ravines, but it is, you know, sort of an act of nature, and, um, you know, we're going to witness how this ravine recovers itself. We're not going to actively try and, you know, recreate what it was, but um, there were, certainly will be some shifts, some winners and some losers as the sky opened up. It's much... There's much more sunlight coming in to this ravine than was this case two and a half years ago. What we would have experienced two and a half years ago is nearly closed canopy, combination of hardwood species like magnolia, hickory, beech, lots of understory, flowering shrubs. Whole lot of grapevines coming up after Hurricane Michael, taking advantage of the newly opened canopy. The grapevines, as soon as the canopy opens up, they form dense thickets covering all of these already downed trees. The magnitude of hurricanes that we are seeing now is, is not historically normal. Hurricane Michael, the storm impacted the entire Apalachicola River system. It tore right up the river corridor and we saw impacts to the entire basin that are still being assessed and measured, quite frankly. The hurricanes, they're natural. They've been occurring for millions of years. But because of climate change, the hurricanes are increasing in intensity. They're increasing in the number of hurricanes. They increase in magnitude at the last couple days a lot of times, from a category one to a category five. Climate change is causing stronger storms, harsher droughts, and sea level rise. With that in mind, how do you restore ecosystems when change is inevitable? One of the questions that we get a lot of times in the context of climate change is, how do we know what we're aiming for? How do we keep up with the changes that are happening in the plant community as the climate changes? And one thing that the Nature Conservancy believes, and, and I think there's a, a lot of good um, sort of thought that's gone into this, is that if we think about places like this, this sand hill, we're not necessarily aiming to conserve all of the individual plants, but we're thinking of it like actors on a stage. And what our goal is to conserve the stage so that whatever movement of actors across the stage happens because of climate change, it will still be here to function that way. And we will do what we can to preserve the space, the stage for them to be, but we've learned to let go of who the specific actors are and what the specific play is gonna look like. Plenty of stories have done it. It seems almost unavoidable sometimes to, to, to see Hurricane Michael damage in a lot of our areas. You know, uh, I went kayaking with Doug and we were enjoying the Chipola River and you could see, you know, the damage to the, the trees and the Chipola River, which is a you know, main tributary of the Apalachicola, an important part of that watershed, and you know, Terea State Park in Steephead Ravines, on beach dunes. Um, so uh, Georgia and Doug, let's talk about what did Hurricane Michael do to, to the Apalachicola water? She kind of just went right up the river corridor, didn't it? And left kind of a lot of long-term damage. Sure did. I'll show you a couple photos. We're gonna, uh, I'll do the first couple in Georgia, do the last couple, but um, I was, my previous job with the DEP, I was able to go out about three days after the storm with some DEP officials and the upper left here, um, this is the entrance road to Terea State Park when the, um, they brought in strike teams from other state parks to clear the road. And so the Terea Park lost probably 60 to 70% of their tree cover. And the lower one is when they cleared the entrance road, but you can still see the major damage there. The uh, aerial photo was taken by a riverkeeper. They went up in a plane to assess some of the damage. And the surviving trees was were completely denuded of the leaves pretty much. So it looked like winter time, even though it was, I think the second week in October. So many of these trees that survived leafed out again before winter. So that was kind of a shocking. It was like a second spring briefly and then winter came. Um, but you can really see the thinned out forest. And when we were at the picnic area at Terea, we could see the Gregory Mansion through the trees, which we would never see before. The lower photo on the right, is the entrance road to Florida Cavern State Park. And so that's before the teams were able to clear the road. And so we had trouble even finding the road. 
there were so many trees and we estimated up to a 90% tree loss in Florida Cavern State Park. So, so this was pretty devastating to the parks, but the region in general lost about um, 2.8 million acres were impacted of forest resources. So basically it's about over 1.3 billion in damages to the forest industry in general. So that will be, uh, the ripples will be felt for many, many years. And we don't really know how some of those lands are gonna recover, whether they're gonna be replanted in trees or, or row crops or, or hemp, who knows? There's different ideas. And a lot of these forests are still being cleared since the hurricane, it's gonna take years uh, for them to recover. On the coastal state parks, this is St. George, I think day four after the storm. The upper left is the entrance road. And it looked like it had been snowing, like two feet of snow basically. So, so the dunes kind of did their, 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 what they need to do is they impacted, they absorbed the storm surge and they kind of flattened out. So they reduced some of the impacts of the storm by being that first barrier to the waves. But it did, did uh, impact some of the human resources like the roads and the bathrooms and so forth. The, the park that probably had the biggest impact was St. Joe State Park on Cape San Blas. And they, they lost the campgrounds and several buildings. And they also had a new channel open up to the bay. So that was pretty severe for that state park. And that one's not open yet, the, the main part of the park. So Georgia's gonna cover some of the other impacts to the river basin. I'll reiterate what Doug said, the effects of Hurricane Michael will be continued to be measured for some time to come. When we talk to the uh, expert fish biologists and others and understanding what happened as a result of the fish kill that we saw on the river in the days following Michael, we've been told it could take four, five, six years to assess some of the impacts. This particular slide is a picture that I took that had three people in the motorboat in tears as we motored through the lower delta of the Apalachicola River, um, watching um, belly up dead um, gulf sturgeon, both adults and juveniles. And it was pretty um, heart-wrenching to see. And this is just one of, of many pictures that we took on a day that we did a, a visual survey out on the lower part of the river. We saw um, fish kill um, in dead lakes as well. And this is all a result both of um, uh, turbidity issues, dropping uh, dissolved oxygen as a result of the storm impact, but we also had runoff and sewage spills and, and things of that um, nature happening. So ecological impacts, and then of course, um, impacts to all the people in the region as well. And again, these are some pictures, both of um, Calhoun County and, and Jackson County in the days right after Hurricane Michael. There are structures still throughout the communities that have not been rebuilt. And um, so, these, these changes will be long-term and, and the recovery will continue for some time to come. The good news is, is that um, our ecosystem can be resilient and if we work together to take care of it and work towards restoration of the system, we can make a big difference together. Okay. Well, thank you, Georgia. Um, we have a question here and I wanna, because I think something Susan might wanna talk about. Um, Beth Wright writes, uh, Hurricane Michael improved shorebird, seabird nesting habitat on St. Vincent National Wildlife Refuge mm -hmm. and other sites. And so you know, Sue actually gave us some slides earlier today on St. Vincent. And it's, it's an interesting story with St. Vincent because it's not all good news there uh, as far as the habitat. Um, Susan, do you want to talk about that? I have several pictures here um, showing, this is uh, the effects of Hurricane Michael. Um, this is about halfway down the, the front um, the Gulf side of the island. And so what we are losing there um, as, the, as the erosion uh, chips into the primary dune is sea turtle nesting habitat. They have a hard time um, with the, the roots that are, that are remaining. Can you go to the next one? Um, this is part of a study that my husband Jeff is doing for through Florida State University on St. Vincent. And you can see that the hurricane uh, took a huge bite out of this particular stretch of primary dune. And there's, I think, a couple more. Just, yeah, another of the same. And one more, Rob. 
actually, we took this one this weekend. This is um, on the Hunt Camp Tahiti Beach side of the island. And uh, what, what we are seeing on the western end of the island, um, there's one more, I think, Bob. Yeah. yeah. On this end of the island, um, it's more of a problem because of the dams up the river. Uh, the sand that's being held back uh, far upstream that you all are concerned about for your um, Apalachicola floodplains also affects uh, the coastal islands. And we see a big retreat in the um, shoreline on the western part of the island. So the, the dams and the hurricanes, um, their effects reverberate throughout the whole Apalachicola system, which only ends out here at West Pass. Thank you, Sue. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about resiliency now. Uh, temperance, I know, we, uh, so as Georgia said, you know, having natural systems you know, means more resiliency for the system. And then, but it's not just uh, you know having a little bit of a, a little bit of forest here and a little bit of a dew in there. Uh, talk about connectivity conservation and, and sort of in our area, especially North Florida, sort of what we have going for us and some of the new things that have happened. I guess new purchases and new uh, acquisitions that. Going to make this a nice patchwork of a uh, of a uh, natural lands. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, so I'll start by talking about two recent really exciting conservation acquisition projects um, that occurred in the Apalachicola watershed, and then I'll talk about some of our other efforts that are going on in the watershed and the broader region. So. Um, the first one I want to mention is the bluffs of Saint Teresa. Um, and I think we have a slide, hopefully, that we can pull up on this, but it's a 17,000 acre, great, um, a piece of property that we have been working with the Department of Environmental Protection um, to protect and um, close on for many, 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 many years. And I'm happy to say um, that despite additional challenges posed by COVID, um, we were able to work with the department to close on this 17,000 acre amazing parcel within the watershed um, at the end of September, so just a few weeks ago, as a matter of fact. Um, and then in addition to the 17,000 acre Bluffs of St. Teresa property, um, back this past December, um, we were able to acquire a property uh, known as Lake Wimico. I think we have an image of that as well. Um, which was a 20,000 acre parcel that we closed on last December. So just, you know, in less than a year, um, after literally decades and uh, upon decades in the making, we have closed on 37,000 acres um, within this watershed. And these are properties that have been high priority conservation acquisitions uh, for decades, and not just for the region, but for the state as a whole. And what's super exciting about them is, um, they fit into a corridor of over a million acres of conserved lands in this watershed. Um, so many entities, ourselves and others, have been working to um, you know, put that uh, patchwork quilt, if you will, together over the years. And it was really exciting to um, bring these two pieces into it and, and connect that full million acres. So Lake Wimico sort of serves as the southern end cap, if you will and the Bluffs of St. Teresa sits a bit in the middle of that million acres, um, resulting in one of the most diverse and important natural protected areas along the entire Gulf Coast. Um, so it's a really unique opportunity and these, these lands within the watershed contribute to a larger effort that the Nature Conservancy has going on, um, which we call our resilient and connected network landscape. And I think we have a slide on this as well but in essence, um, the Nature Conservancy has been doing some extensive science um, highlighting climate resilient sites across the continental US. Um, and collectively, these sites represent the extraordinary natural diversity of our country. So it really represents the biodiversity that we need to protect. And these sites also have unique characteristics that can help withstand climate impacts and keep nature safe in the face of climate change uh, through things like migratory pathways. So, so we know some species will be able to relocate as a result of climate change impacts um, to new homes within their kind of their local resilient neighborhood, if you will. Um, and micro topography can play a big role in that. So a site like ABRP um, has a lot of potential to provide resilience because it has a lot of micro topography and can provide a lot of niche habitats, 
habitats in a small space. Um, other species are obviously going to need to move much greater distances to entirely new landscapes. And this is something that Brian was touching on with the with the actors analogy. Um, and if these pathways are destroyed, many species could disappear forever. So um, the Nature Conservancy has been focusing on getting the, the message out about this network of lands across the US, what it represents um, from a biodiversity standpoint, point, but also the benefits it can provide to people in the form of tourism, freshwater supplies, carbon storage, you know, et cetera. Um, so, We've acquired these lands recently within the watershed that are a big contributor to this million acre corridor. Um, but we're also working on a lot of other efforts in this watershed and in the region. Um, so we're working in the Apalachicola watershed, uh, St. Andrews and St. Joe Bay, and all the way over to Pensacola. Um, and we're working on things like watershed plans, estuary programs, oyster management plans and other uh, comprehensive efforts to try to restore these watersheds. Um, so those efforts that we're doing in Florida across the panhandle, um, including Apalachicola, affect the larger Gulf of Mexico whole uh, ecosystem. Talk about connectedness between ecosystems. And the Nature Conservancy is also working across the entire Gulf of Mexico region. So we're working in all of the states that surround the Gulf. We're working together on Deepwater Horizon. We're working together on the Mississippi River system, the biggest tributary to the Gulf. So we're trying to work on these issues at all scales from, you know, specifically within the Apalachicola watershed, but into the larger Gulf um, and the systems that feed into the Gulf. Um, and at the end of the day, we think these are things that are important for the reasons we've already mentioned, um, but also because we have data that proves that natural systems like mangroves, Oyster and coral reefs, coastal wetlands, dune systems provide significant erosion, flooding, and wave runoff benefits. Um, so these systems not only provide biodiversity and climate migratory pathways, but they actually provide resilience to our communities today while we're dealing with increasing storms and hurricanes. And they contribute um, to the potential for an ecotourism based economy. Um, of which Florida has a lot of. We're the, the, we're the second largest contributor to the overall U.S. outdoor recreation economy as a state um, with more potential, I think, in places like the Forgotten Coast. So um, it's all about the big picture, how all these things fit together um, and the benefits extend from biodiversity to economic impacts um, to community resilience benefits. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here. The, the land purchases are tremendous, but are there any parallel successes for securing water entering the ecosystem? Oh, yeah, I see Georgia answered that in the comments. Is there, uh, do you want to expound on that, uh, Georgia? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to chime in. And um, thank you, Catherine, so much for that really important question. So as I um, started with uh, earlier in the talk, the changes in the flow to the Apalachicola River have been altered over years um, by the Army Corps of Engineers. More water is being held upstream and less water is making it out into the floodplain and ultimately into the Apalachicola Bay in the Eastern Gulf of Mexico. So we've seen um, a lot of negative impacts um, that we don't have time to expand, expand on here, but I, I would hope that you would um, check out our, our web, website to learn some more. And I also know, Catherine, you're, you're familiar with this issue. Um, Riverkeeper has an active legal challenge to the Army Corps of Engineers water control manual. So I, I'd encourage you to learn more about that. Um, that water control manual dictates when and how flows are being released and, and how much water is making it downstream. When they updated the control manual a couple years ago, um, they dialed back even more water. And these are uh, legal challenges obviously um, are slow. There's also probably everybody's aware that there's a uh, court, a case in the uh, U.S. Supreme Court, Florida versus Georgia. Um, folks know a lot about that case. That one is also ongoing. That case is uh, seven years old now. So also slow and all the time that we spend, um, it means more waiting for the habitat and, and the creatures that rely on it. The other thing that we can do collectively is making sure that our members both um, state elected officials as well as congressional officials know that we would like to see the Army Corps of Engineer 
um, consider the health and, of the Apalachicola River and Bay, the entire Apalachicola River and Bay. Currently, they're not required. And I'm, I'm abridging a lot of history and, and speaking really quickly on this. So um, I hope folks will follow up with me for more details. But suffice to say, um, the Army Corps of Engineers is not required to give full consideration to the ecological health of the Appala Lower Apalachicola River and the Bay. It's not part of their mandate, if you will. We could get Congress to change that. It's also one of the reasons Riverkeeper has a legal challenge to the water control manual. So these are all important things that we do have to do in tandem with the physical projects that we're all doing, all these different organizations that love this watershed from you know, making sure that land is purchased and protected. And we're so excited that the Lake Wimico property and this other purchase happened recently because protecting land protects water. And it's important that we um, get these sloughs cleaned up and we make sure oyster habitat restoration efforts take place. So we've got to come at the, the problem from multiple different angles. I'm not sure if I an totally answered Catherine's question because I kind of wandered there, but um, things are happening, but there's always more to be done. Absolutely. Great. Thanks, I think a, a parallel project that um, uh, comes to mind is the Kissimmee River restoration that's gone on for decades since the Corps of Engineers ditched the river and now they're trying to put the curve back in the channels and restore the floodplain and restore the upriver uh, areas as well. So that was a huge effort and it's still going on as well in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. Good parallel, Doug. Having worked on that for years, that it is there are some commonalities. And and the good news in the Kissimmee River restoration story for us is how remarkably well that system recovered and how quickly, um, you know, unexpectedly so. So we can only hope we can see those kind of results in in other systems. Great. Well, we are. Just about there at time. I see one more question, and maybe this is a question for you, Temperance, about uh, Sierra Hardigan writes that Oyster Project is the only thing I know of in Northwest Florida. Is there a way to have land purchases in Escambia, Santa Rosa? I know you guys are doing work in Escambia. That's the, you're doing stuff in Pensacola Bay. We talked about that, right? Uh, yeah. So we are working on like large estuary plans that look at the issues like upland issues, sedimentation, lands that need to be protected. So we are working with those communities to prioritize those things and to help try to get estuary programs in place so more of those types of protection efforts can occur. Um, so yeah, there's a lot underway. There's a lot more that needs to happen. And frankly, we're also working on these issues at the statewide level. Some of the issues you raise about development and some of the challenges those things pose I think in many cases are best addressed at you know the regional uh, or statewide level when where we can and we're certainly uh, trying to work on those things. Thank you, Temperance. I think we're gonna before we head out. We uh, Susan has one more uh, passage to read from. I have been assigned a single bird. Oh, Susan. Oh, is Susan still here? <laughs> oh, there you are. Oh, you're muted, Susan. Oh, uh, okay. There you are. So I say it's my, my privilege to say thank you so much to WFSU for this wonderful program and to Riverkeeper and the Nature Conservancy for the work that they do without which our bioregion would, would, would languish. Um, I wanted to say that standing up for these North Florida lands and watersheds, the, our bioregion, is very similar to offering care to people that we love that are, that are not well. And in all cases, we are required to be fierce and full-bodied advocates, which all of these people you've heard from tonight are. In an endless series of actions, small and large, each, each is important as the next. Anything we do this year or next is worth 10 of the same thing 10 years from now. Nothing has been more important than holding the world back from the perilously close tipping points we haven't yet crossed. So this makes us in, a, in an interesting way, the most powerful people who have ever lived. We have been granted an astonishingly beautiful gift, the chance to shepherd human and animal life into the coming centuries and millennia when we know it might otherwise disappear. 
but the work has to start now. There's plenty for every one of us, and it has to be swift. We're on our own, but we are billions. So thank you. Thank you. That was yeah. awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, this was a. Uh, I really enjoyed this last hour, and I enjoyed enjoyed going out with Brian and Lily to Western Ravines, and going out to St. George, and talking to talking Georgia. Uh, and of course, always fun working with you, Susan. Uh, it's been a while since we've been. Oh, actually, no, it hasn't been that long. Bald point. No, it wasn't that long ago at all. So thank you all. Um, Age of Nature airs on WFSU TV, ten o'clock tomorrow night. We have. Um, I see a question about Tate Cell here. We've covered that a little bit, and I wouldn't mind going back and doing more. Um, Age of Nature, yeah. Uh, next Wednesday and the Wednesday after, uh, 10 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, WFSU TV. Um, and of course, you could always catch uh, our ecology work on the ecology blog, wfsu.org slash ecology blog. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, I thought that was a really fun discussion. Um, and if you have a chance, scroll up there. I'll paste it in here again. We have a survey for uh, for all of our, oh, sorry, wrong window. Survey here for anyone who has time to fill one out for our funder at PBS. So uh, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Be safe.